first off, Colorado is saying that they don't want to put Trump on the ballot because it says in the Constitution that nobody who has been involved in an insurrection can go on the ballot. And this was in the 14th Amendment. It, obviously, it's it's was probably made to apply to anybody who was involved in the Civil War can't be president of the United States. And so, so they're kind of invoking that amendment to say Trump can't be on the ballot. And the Supreme Court's basically said the states don't have the power to decide who the president of the United States is. That's a really complicated case. I think almost everybody thinks the court will say that Colorado can't do what it wanted to do. But there are all sorts of reasons why the court could decide that. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. So, Jay, I, I have I have a bunch of questions about the Constitution as related to current events, because I feel like more than I've ever seen in the past 24 years, 25 years, I'm, I'm thinking like Gore, Bush, that election. Right. I haven't seen so many constitutional battles like on the front page of the news the, as as I am these past few weeks and few years. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's probably right. I mean. It's a combination of uh, a president who doesn't follow any of the, or former president who doesn't follow norms. Uh, and so it gives rise to these issues that, you know, constitutional law professors, for example, have been like thinking about, but never thought would actually occur. Uh, uh, and, that, and so it's a combination of that, I think, plus a new Supreme Court that is uh, willing to change its view on lots of things so that invites you know uh cases to be brought that, that they basically invite cases that w which they can use to kind of rethink the law so uh i can see how that would uh you know how you can perceive that because it's it i don't know if it's true or not but i i think it probably is true uh certainly the media it, it's uh i mean yeah sorry well Bad well one. you know and let's start with a very broad question. Like the Supreme Court in the Constitution didn't have the power to, to decide what was constitutional or not. So that's well, it was unclear. That's it was, something... Yeah, right. I mean, it, until 1803, it w that wasn't clear, right? I mean, I think some the framers probably thought that the court had judicial the power of judicial review, but it wasn't it wasn't clear, and it wasn't until John Marshall, uh, uh, you know, took took the lead of the Supreme Court and made it into a, a powerful institution. And Marbury versus Madison announced that there was this power of judicial review. So yeah, once we started that, it was inevitable that the court would become more powerful. Marbury versus Madison so, is a fascinating case. I love teaching it. It's really, it's very what, cool. What was the case? Well, I mean, what's so interesting about the case is that, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to, I can't get into all the details, but, but, but Marshall did not have to decide the issue. He did not have to reach the question of whether there was judicial review or not. He sort of misread on purpose both the part of the Constitution he was interpreting and the statute that was arguably in violation of the Constitution. He read them to conflict with each other so that he could come up with a, you know, announce the power of judicial review. Uh, I don't think pe most people know that, but it's not at all clear when you look at the language of the constitutional provision about original jurisdiction and appellate jurisdiction. And then the statute, which purported to give the, the Supreme Court you know, uh, original jurisdiction, but not appellate jurisdiction, to do this thing to order, uh, uh, um, to order the 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 delivery of an appointment of a judge. So so he manufactured it all, and and not only that, it, it's fascinating because he was he should have re recused himself too because he was had been the Secretary of State uh, when the when when the 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 commissions to the judges were, were signed. He signed them because he was the, he was the secretary of state and the chief justice of the Supreme court at the same time. And, uh, so, so he did all these sort of maneuvers to, to, to be able to be in the case and then decide the case in the way he wanted. And then to create this powerful institution, pretty amazing. But, but that's an interesting thing too. And this is, this is actually related to one of the constitutional issues happening now, but you know, you can't be, According to the Constitution, and this is a little known clause, you mentioned it in your book, The Odd Clauses, you can't be a senator or a congressman and work in the executive branch at the same time. 
because of the separation of powers. How come it's the case that you can you can be in in the executive branch and at least in this case the judicial branch? Yeah. So for one thing, I don't I don't think um, uh, anybody like cared about about the the issue in eighteen oh three. So nobody. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some people did say, "Hey, you can't do both of these things," but I don't think it was particularly controversial at the time. So you know, sometimes parts of the Constitution lie dormant uh, for a long time before they're they they become part of the national conversation or people recognize that they're they're important. But also, it's I think the terms of that of that uh, constitutional provision you're talking about the incompatibility clause. Um, uh, only applies to l- members of the legislative branch and the executive, right? So, so it might still be the case you could be the, a Supreme Court justice and a Secretary of State. I hope not. I, I don't think under general principles of separation of powers law you could, but it's possible. Well, I have to go read. It seems that. like it seems like if they if they planned it between you know they they really put this separation of powers in between Congress and the executive office, they should have done it for the judicial branch and the executive branch, but it seems like they forgot it or for some reason it wasn't as important. Maybe there's a story there. Uh, There probably is a story. I don't know it. Um, uh, But I've never heard, you know, I've never, I I also don't know all the historical kind of scholarship about Marbury versus Madison and John Marshall. I've read some books and things about it, but I don't don't remember anybody, you know, being a big deal that he was doing both things at once. Uh, Maybe, and you know, maybe it's because at the time, the Supreme Court wasn't so powerful. And in fact, you know, there were there were people who turned down, I, I believe, the chief justice position. They were like, I, I don't want to be in this little court. I've got, you know, businesses and, and uh, other things to do. Like the Supreme Court wasn't the Supreme Court until Marshall made it the Supreme Court uh, through Marbury versus Madison and some other cases. So so perhaps it wasn't even viewed as like a big deal at all. Like so, so somebody's a Secretary of State and the Supreme yeah. on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's not a big deal anyway. Perhaps we've actually um, just as a side note, we we have this podcast has visited the Supreme Court because I think the only Supreme Court justice who's ever been on a podcast was Sonia Sotomayor was uh-huh. on this podcast. Oh, awesome! So yeah, I gotta so to that. Um, okay. The the yeah, it was very interesting, and I was very pleased that she she actually reached out to me to come on the podcast. Oh, very. And uh, so okay, so the questions I have first one is this this Texas border thing. So you know Texas has um, this one area uh, near a town called Eagles Pass, I guess, where the the Texas Border Patrol or the Texas National Guard has put up razor wire on the wall, and the Biden administration wants to take down the razor wire. And this has gone all the way up to the Supreme Court, which since since it's the part of the federal laws that the go- federal government is in charge of the border, the Supreme Court ruled that the federal laws override the state laws. And so that was, the, the, the federal argument is that they override the state. And now the state argument, so Governor Greg Abbott his argument was is that there's a clause in the Constitution which says that if the federal government does not respond to an invasion, then the state has power to fight the invasion. And he labeled the immigration an invasion. Now, subtext to this is that what is what constitu- is immigration is illegal immigration and invasion that's not specified in the in the Constitution. But James Madison has written in uh, in another place that immigration does not count as an invasion. So it's so. So what's what's the answer? There's all these disputes, and the and the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government does override the state in this case, but there was loopholes and and so on. Uh-huh. So it's still ongoing, right? And uh, that that's a great you know question because it raises uh, this uh, this this issue about how constitutional provisions, uh, who even people who teach constitutional law, you know, may for ten years or whatever, might not have even really thought of or paid attention to. And that, that clause that you're talking about, I'm, I'm, I got my constitution right here. Little, <laughs> little guy, you got to keep one everywhere, right? If you're on law professor, right? So it's, it's section 10 of article one, which says, you know, a state, uh, a state can't engage in war unless actually invaded. Um, that it actually, 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 be, you know, so I, the word actually is pretty fascinating there. Like, yeah, like as, and they could have just said in, unless inv- invaded, right? And 
And, and so that, you know, that word people will, uh, scholars will d debate, like, why is that there? Does that mean that it has to be like an invasion? That's like a real invasion. So you, it, it like limits the word invasion, et cetera. So I, you know, it, it seems to me like immigration is not an invasion. That, that seems fair. Like, I think that, that, that the, the framers of the constitution would have used a different word if they were included, but uh, if they were going to include uh, uh, immigration there. But, but, but that could be incorrect as well. I'm not, not, I'm not an originalist, so I don't well, know, but know, you know, everything about why they, why they put that in there. Um, but it, it is, uh, it's fascinating, right? So what, so, and then if it were an invasion, then what, what effect would that have on the federal government's ability to go in and, and cut the wire, right? Cut the razor wire, which is what the case is right all about. I love that, that that case came up. It came up right when I was teaching this classic old, another jo uh, a John Marshall case called McCulloch versus Maryland, which is about whether a state could tax the, the Bank of the United States. And the Supreme Court said a state can't, you know, tax the United States. That would give the state the power to destroy the federal government. And it was one of those early cases that established that the federal government was kind of supreme to the states at a, it, when they conflict on most issues. And so the, the United States brief on this issue in the Supreme Court starts right off and says, you know, since 1810 or whenever McCulloch versus Maryland was decided, you know, this kind of thing has not been allowed. And, and, and so it was like, it was like this famous old case brought to the, to the modern day. And I, you know, I think that's probably why what the, you know, why the Supreme Court held the way it did that the, that this is the federal government, the states in a conflict over something that's really about federal law and the states can't get in the way of the, uh, of the feds take care of the border. So it was a, just an illustration of this age old or 200 year old principle, uh, that Mar that, that Marshall announced. And does it specify in the constitution that, um, the fed, the federal government is in charge of the border, protecting the border? Uh, yeah. And, and Congress pretty much has given, uh, uh, is given the power to, to regulate uh, immigration, the president, um, well, yeah, no, I, uh, I, it certainly has been interpreted that the federal government has, and particularly Congress has kind of what they call plenary power over immigration. So, and so I think that's pretty well established, at least by the courts interpreting the constitution. Uh, there may be language in the constitution that could give rise to an argument the other way. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, so in, in I guess it's uh, Section 9 mm -hmm. of Article 1, it says uh, the migration or importa importation. Uh, right, right. Yeah, t they're, they're, everybody, uh, people who were already immigrating right then were grandfathered in until 1808, and then after that, Congress is in charge. Right. Uh, so, so, not, yeah. mm -hmm. so the question is, though, um, I guess there's Greg Abbott's question, which is, which which you're addressing, which um, was it an invasion or not? In which case he could say the federal government's not acting how it should. So he needs to take over. And then there's, I guess, I guess, well, I guess that is the main, the main issue. Then, then I guess there's the fact that it's only this specific idea that the federal government has the idea to cut the razor wire down, but it doesn't say anything about Texas putting new razor wire back up immediately. So that's the loophole that has, has been in place right now. And they'll, and they'll go back and forth, right. Um, until the court, you know, issues some, some final ruling, which they haven't in this particular case. And, and, but even then, you know, then what happens, right? The court, the court doesn't have it's, uh, any enforcement power, right? The court doesn't have, uh, it has no money and it has no army, right? The court can't enforce its own rulings. It's a pretty interesting thing. But the right? federal but government can. The federal government can, right? And they'll say, uh, and they'll say we have the authority under, you know, under the court's decisions and, and maybe they'll, you know, they'll keep battling perhaps if the state doesn't give in. I'm not sure the state made the invasion argument in its briefs in that case, or if it was, if it was a later, you know, thing that Abbott was talking about that might make its way into the, into the, into the case later. I'm not sure about that. The court didn't say anything about, right. That its decision was, was there was, it was one of these orders without explanation. So it's unclear if the court thought about this invasion argument, if it is presented to the, to it properly, or will just think about it later. 
And it also not sure that even if it is invasion that gives the state the rights to the right to act, whether if the feds decide to jump in instead, uh, whether the feds, you know, might be able to, uh, to, to sort of preempt the state's decision. Right. So in other words, I think it's a separate question, whether the state has the power to act if there's no federal action versus the state versus the, the state having the power to repel the federal government, if the federal government decides it wants to step in. And I'd be I really, see. I'd be really surprised if the state ends up prevailing on that, even, even with this work. So, so, right. So, so whether or not it's invasion, if the federal government acts, then they acted and the state doesn't have any power over that. Right. Like, like back in 1800 or 1790 or whenever, the federal government sometimes couldn't muster an army fast enough to act. And hence this clause, it was the real original reason for this clause. So, but it's interesting. Can the federal government, like Texas is the main state I guess California also that uh, essentially protects the border, right? And I guess it's a, an interesting question. Well, that's not totally true. There's also the northern border. There's plenty of states on the southern border. Montana. But it's an interesting question. Like, yeah, like it, it's an interesting question. If if the if if the people in Texas, if Texas itself as a state is overwhelmed by immigration, do they have no power at all? Right. Right. And. Yeah, that's a great, it's a good question. And they would say that that's what's happened, right? Um, the feds would, would say, you know, we're, we're doing what we can and it's our kind of, you know, it's our area. And, and if we're acting at all, and we are, you know, maybe not the Texas's liking, it's really the feds tr decision and Texas is, has to resort to the political process, uh, to try to get right. The federal government to act differently. I mean, I think that's. You know, because otherwise you get all these, you know, each state making its own sort of immigration policy. And, and, and the, the, the court at least has always thought, has always talked about how we need kind of one voice when it comes to international relations, foreign affairs. And I think that includes immigration also. So, you know, I, I, I this, this is a court that's highly solicitous of state, states' rights. And I, you know, I understand that, but I, I think on this kind of question, I, I think I'd be, I would be really surprised if the court were, would have sided with Texas. Okay. Cause, cause then there's the, of course the, I guess it's the 10th amendment, which says any law is not specifically prescribed by the federal government goes to the States. But you can argue, like you just said, that immigration is something that the constitution has specifically said is foreign relations in general, is something that's, uh, you know, done by the president and Congress and so on. Right, right. And so if the Constitution gives the federal government the power to handle immigration, then then the Tenth Amendment doesn't, uh, you know, wouldn't kick in. I mean, the Tenth Amendment, it's interesting how the court has interpreted the Tenth Amendment over the time, over, over the years. Basically, the, the only thing the court has said the Tenth Amendment does is prevent the federal government from ordering states to do things directly. Um, and, and that's come up some, you know, several times. It's kind of the whole reason why uh, marijuana can be legal at the state level while it's not legal at the federal level because the federal government can't order states to make it illegal because that would violate the 10th Amendment. Um, that's the sort of the 10th Amendment's quiet uh, power in, that we that I think most people don't recognize. Uh, well, but, what does that mean, actually? Like, does that mean Congress can't pass a law against murder, for instance? Every state has to pass their own law against murder? Well, uh, so the United States can pass, uh, can, can promulgate a, 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 a murder statute, but it has to be, um, connected to some existing federal power. So, um, and usually that federal power is, uh, the commerce clause power, which so, so, uh, article one, section eight lays out all these specific powers that Congress has and the, the most broad of those powers is this thing called the Commerce Clause, which gives the Congress the power to make rules if they have significant effects on interstate commerce, kind of. And so the federal criminal laws are limited because they have to have this kind of interstate, usually have to have some interstate uh, aspect to them or something. Um, but um, so that would be the, <laughs> there would be a federal murder law in particular situations. Um, and then, of course, the state, uh, with the original question, <laughs> remind me of the original question. So, so, so if someone fills up on on gas, if a murderer yeah. 
fills up on gas in New Jersey and then drives to New York and kills some kills someone. Does that break the federal murder law? Like, because there's there was commerce done in New Jersey in order to kill someone in New York. Right. Yeah. No, I'd have to look at the federal murder law, but but that would be the kind of uh, murder that the feds could reach. But most cr- most criminal laws are, are state. You know, are state uh, are created by the state and implemented by the state and you know enforced by the state. But there, it, it, it and, and there's different crimes too, right? You could that's why the federal government could could uh, could enforce. You know, sometimes the state somebody gets off on state law, but then the feds prosecute them, right? So they're separate because they're separate sovereigns. So there's no double jeopardy problem, and um, so it's a yeah, it's a uh, the relationship between the feds and the states, and, and we're doing that right now in constitutional law in my class. It's uh, it's it's fascinating. Well, so well related to this then. Kind of on the other side of things is uh, C- Colorado. So Colorado, it, there's a couple of interesting issues here. First off, Colorado is saying that they don't want to put Trump on the ballot because it says in the Constitution that nobody who has been involved in an insurrection uh, can go on the ballot. And this was in the 14th Amendment. It, obviously, it's it's was probably made to apply to anybody who was involved in the Civil War can't be president of the United States. And so so they're kind of invoking that amendment to say Trump can't be on the ballot. And the federal, this has gone up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's basically said the states don't have the power to decide who the president of the United States is. So it's almost similar to the, the that case you mentioned where Maryland can't tax the United States. So the, a state can't do something that affects the whole United States. and And that seems to be where the Supreme Court I don't know if they've invoked the Tenth Amendment or what, but but that's what they decided. Yeah, well, no, they haven't decided the case yet. Um, I mean, they heard oral argument on it. I mean, unless something happened today, did something no, happen today? I, I mean, I, no, no, I don't know. Um, no, I mean, I think I think you're right that that's how it's going to come out based on how the oral argument went, right? Um, the there's the, there's a lot of issues in that case. That's a really complicated case, and it was kind of. Um, Court watchers are really interested to see what the questions were going to be because there are a lot of different ways the court could go on it. Um, uh, I think almost everybody thinks the court will will say that Colorado can't do what it what it wanted to do, but it, but it, but there are all sorts of reasons why the court could decide that it could be you know there's a whole argument about in the case about whether the president is ex, is an officer of the United States under the Constitution, um, and that you know that was at asked about it, the oral argument briefly, but probably not enough that, that it indicates that that's how the court's going to go. The court seemed to be very concerned with, as you say, the state's, the state power here and the federalism concerns, like why, right? The, the constitution doesn't say how that prohibition um, uh, on, on, on somebody involved in an insurrection can't be present, how that gets enforced or becomes, you know, part of the, 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 it actually gets implemented. The Constitution is unclear about that. To the extent it says anything, it sort of sounds like Congress should do it because Congress has the power to enforce the 14th Amendment under Section 5 of that amendment. Um, you know, whether states can use the access to their ballots to to do it, uh, it's it's kind of a hard, hard argument for the states to make. Um, I, I mean, I, Justice Kagan, you know, said, asked, uh, asked that we're arguing, you know, why should the state of Colorado be able to decide who becomes president or not? And I think every, everybody has that feeling that, that this is not something that each state one by one can do. At the same time, I don't think the Fed, the Supreme Court's going to decide like what counts as an insurrection and was, you know, Trump sufficiently involved that he shouldn't be, that he's bit barred from the ballot. Um, well, yeah, that was the other question I had was if, if I were on the Trump legal team here, I was, has there been due process that says Trump was involved in an insurrection? That yeah, that was an issue a, a bit at the uh, at the at the argument. I'm not sure the due pro- process necessarily um, you know attaches to that particular um, you know provision. I mean, and if it did, what it would re- what it would look like? Um, how would you you know how does 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 he have to be criminally uh, you know found guilty? Of- for participating in an insurrection. Nobody, I think, has been charged under the insurrection statute with respect to January 6th. Um, 
uh, you know, does the impeachment? Yeah, what does what the, have they been charged with? Like, the, break, like entering the Capitol without permission, or like what? Yeah, what was know. the law that most people broke? I'm not really sure. Uh, but 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 not the insurrection. Not the ins- law. Right, there is a law that prohibits insurrection. It's a fe- federal law, but and, and as I understand it, none of the January six people have been indicted under it. Um, though it's been used maybe once or twice or something in the past. Uh, so and but there was the impeach. You know, is the impeachment? Does that? Provide you does that count as due process if due process supplies? Um, or is this just a political kind of decision, you know, um, such that maybe it, it doesn't require due process? So I think that's kind of up in the air too. But, but, but you're right. Like, uh, um, or, or would the, would the arguments would be being made before the court in this context constitute due process? Like they, they would be arguing in the briefs about it in the lower courts. You know, was this an insurrection? What did he do? You know, what didn't he do? Does that count as due process? Um, I don't think we'll ever find out. But, but the, yeah. The, the other thing is, can't a state, isn't it one of the powers of this state to decide who is on their ballot? Like every state has different rules about who is on their ballot. Like you have to have a certain number of signatures. You have to be, have, have a certain number of, amount of cash maybe um you know in your in your campaign funds so if that's a state power couldn't they decide i mean they certainly decide a lot of candidates don't go on the ballot yeah. why do they have to put a republican or democrat candidate on the ballot yeah so i'm i don't know that area a lot that well what i do know though is that uh is that the court has said that con uh, that the states can't add qualifications uh to the the particular officers federal officers uh and that might be the distinction like they can do a lot for state officers but maybe not as much for federal officers and uh, and their access to the to the ballots um the the court has said that states can't add to the qualifications that are in the constitution that are that, like the president has to be 35 you know and be a citizen of so long etc and and uh at one point a state maybe it was alabama wanted to impose term limits for their members of Congress. And so they, they, they basically said, you know, if you've been uh, a senator for two terms, then you can't be, have access to the ballot. And the court said, no, you can't do that. Cause that's basically a state adding, um, adding a qualification for federal office to that, to those that are included in the constitution that the states can't do. And that case came up a bunch during this oral argument. So, so I, 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 I don't think the state's going to prevail on that uh, on that strategy. And I'm just trying to think now from the, from the state's point of view, the state doesn't allow everybody who's running for president on the ballot. So for if you go to fbc.gov and fill out 10 minutes worth of paperwork to run for president, then you're officially a federal candidate for president. I know this because I've done it. I'm <laughs> officially a federal candidate for president. But I cannot get on the Colorado ballot no matter what because Colorado has qualifications like you have to get a certain number of signatures and maybe your party had to be on the ballot hmm. the prior four years so there are state by state rules about which presidential candidate is allowed on the ballot and this was a case though i guess where trump if he gets the nomination would have satisfied all the qualifications but they're still saying he can't go on the ballot because of this insurrection idea yeah and, I, I, and to your I don't know. I mean, I, I you might have a loss. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you can't get on the ballot, no, I'm suing. I, you, you should. You should sue. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'd I'd have to look into that. Like I, I, you know, I don't know why the states would be able to uh, not allow you on the ballot. Well, because there's there's thousands of people officially running, <laughs> so you have to figure out. Like RFK Jr. can't get on the ballot in in many states. I don't know if he's going to make fifty percent of the states or not. But, uh, you know, the two party systems never been was specified in the Constitution, but that seems kind of encased in state law, state by state. So I'm just curious where the state's rights end there and and, and you know, the federal begins. But it, it seems like what, what they're saying, though, that that might be the problem, I guess, is that, tr- you know, Donald Trump would make all the qualifications and they're still going to say he he can't be on the ballot for this federal reason, the insurrection reason. So like, for instance, can a state not put someone on the ballot 
if they're 29 years old. So in the Constitution, it says you have to be 35. You bring this up in your book, The Odd Clauses. Is the state allowed to not put someone on the ballot mm -hmm. and they've met all their rules, but they're 29 years old? Uh, and, and then it's up to the federal to just say this guy can't be president if he wins. I don't, you know, that did come up at the oral argument. Um, the, the question was kind of like, let's say a state decided not to al allow access to the ballot to somebody who was, was going to be 35 at the time of the election, maybe, but, 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 or, or wasn't going to be 35 at the time of the election, but would have been 35 at the time of, that they would take office president. And that, and the argument was that they, they, the, that they could not keep somebody off the, the ballot in that situation. I, this sounds like, you know, I, I'm uh, wary of getting into uh, stuff that I know very little about because I'll say something. Uh, you know, the, the the careful lawyer in me, I guess, uh, is wary about this. I because I I think that the states have maybe there's some federal laws that regulate the stuff, and that's where all the stuff comes from. But from what my uh, you know, listening to this oral argument, there is really I, I, everyone seemed to agree that there is really a lot of restrictions on what the states do could do to keep people off the ballot for federal office. So I'm just going to have to do some research. <laughs> but it, I mean, it sounds like the Supreme court though, says you can't, you can't get in the way of, again, it's that, it's that, it's that Maryland versus the bank of the U S case. Like you can't, a state can't do something that's going to affect the livelihoods of everybody else in the United States. Yes. Yeah. I, I, whether it's, you know, going to be specifically that case or just sort of the general principles that come, I think it's unclear what the source of the, this ruling is going to be, whether it's kind of a, a gen, maybe it will draw on the 10th amendment. I wouldn't be, you know, who knows? Um, um, but, but, but it, it just, it, it, it seems clear what the, what the court was concerned about and what it doesn't want to happen. And then now it's going to figure out kind of a way. Uh, to to make it happen, and I'm sure there is there's a way there are many ways to do it, and it'll, that might be what they're you know debating about now why they haven't issued an opinion yet, you know, figuring out exactly what they're going to rest their decision on. That happens all the so, time. So okay, so I I have a, a now this is probably a bigger question, and this involves this is in 2020 COVID when essentially I don't know if it was the federal government or state by state. But essentially, every business was required to shut down. And I'm not arguing whether this was a good thing or a bad thing or whether more lives were lost if, if this hadn't occurred or, or lives were saved because this did occur. But in the Fifth Amendment, it says, uh, essentially, no one should be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And like I had a business on the streets of Manhattan in New York City. And it was, of course, shut down by COVID. And did that not deprive me of liberty and property um, with, you know, nor shall private property be taken for public use, again, without due process of law and without just compensation. So this due process of law part is what bothers me with the COVID shutdowns. There, there really was no due process for any business. And many, many generational businesses and families lost their whole incomes, went bankrupt. You know, it was just a catastrophe on a, on a business side. Again, this is, I'm not arguing whether it saved lives or not, this law, but was this sure. unconstitutional, this law? You know, so there was a period of time uh, in the, between like 1905 and 1937, specifically 1937, during which uh, the Supreme Court said that the due process clause placed like really strong limits on the, the government's authority to regulate businesses in all sorts of ways. And uh, basically said it was it, 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 like a regulation that said, for example, uh, a, uh, a business couldn't uh, hire, use child labor, for example, um, you know, that, that, that's, that, that might not be the right case to use, but um, I like wage hour laws, those kinds of things. The court struck lots of those laws down in this period. Um, and that period was, co it was known as the Lochner era because it was, it was, there was a case, a famous case about the hours that bakers could work. And, uh, and the Supreme Court said that those, those regulations were unconstitutional because they violated the due process rights of businesses. Um, and, but the court 
sort of made a 180 degree change on that in 1937. And that, that actually was the kind of the switch, the switch in time, the save nine, that whole classic thing, which saved the court because Owen Roberts, one of the Supreme Court justices who was always striking things down, switched his vote. And, and since then, I would say kind of general regulations uh, of businesses of all sorts have received kind of the lo lowest amount of scrutiny under the due process clause that the court uses. Basically, the court has said any kind of rational regulation, any regulation that has any kind of reason, reasonable justification is sufficient for due process purposes. And so, um, you know, I think that's, it, it, one, would, one could disagree with that, of course, um, uh, but that's what the court has said and, uh, and has never, you know, sort of revived this whole period, uh, 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 from the Lochner year. So, so there's really little kinds of little that, uh, in the due process clause that businesses have been able to rely on that may be not, uh, you know, a good thing in all circumstances, but that's what the court has said. I think in, in some states though, where, where this was brought to court, uh, businesses sued, it got up to the state Supreme Court. I don't think it ever went up to the Supreme Court. And it was struck down as unconstitutional, the closing of businesses. I think it was in Minnesota or Wisconsin. I'm sorry, I forget which state. But I think I think it became like an open issue. But, you know, eventually the lockdowns relaxed mm -hmm. and, and it didn't go all the way up to the Supreme Court. I um I'm, so I'm not familiar with those state cases. What I what I do remember uh are the cases involving religion, because I my, um, you know, I teach law and religion and it's been a long focus of mine. And so there's some really interesting cases about if the government closes churches, right. Or places regulations on, on religious get togethers, various kinds, um, you know, are those constitutional uh, or not? Do those violate the it's kind of the free exercise of religion rights of these churches and other religious institutions? And the Supreme court decided several cases where they kind of compared the restrictions that were placed on religion to the restrictions that were placed on other kinds of businesses. And if the court didn't think that they were kind of the same, the court, uh, that they treated religion worse than other sorts of businesses, then the court had struck down the, that like the, there was a law in Brooklyn, um, that, that fell under this sort of theory. The court, the court thought that, 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 that New York or, uh, yeah, the state of New York had treated religious groups worse than say, uh, supermarkets and so that was a problem that was that was fascinating i thought those cases like well in, in what in what way were uh supermarkets treated differently well like so, so so if i remember right in this case like supermarkets uh were open you know there were some restrictions on how many people could go in the supermarkets but the churches were closed uh or they had very few people were allowed in them and then there were also laws about, um, like performances, theater, comedy, uh, concerts, sporting events, right. The, and, and they were closed. And the question was, um, you know, are, are the churches kind of more like, uh, like the, like the sporting events where people are yelling and singing, or are they more like the supermarkets where people are just sort of gathering and doing, you know, their daily business. And the, and Justice Sotomayor said, Look, it's they're they're treated the same way as theaters and 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 sporting events churches are, and that makes sense because people are singing and you know so they have to be you know clamped down on more than the the, the supermarkets where people are singing and chanting or whatever, and, and are, are those are safer. So, but the court, the majority of the court, disagreed and thought, look, if you're going to close the supermarkets, uh, I mean, if you're gonna, if you're going to leave the supermarkets open. Am I getting this right? This is like the LSAT. Uh, if you're keeping the supermarkets open, then, then you got to keep the churches open. And, uh, so that's, that's how that case came out, if I remember right. So I wonder if that's also related to the COVID situation because supermarkets were kept open. Oh yeah. This is closed. all COVID. They, these are all COVID cases, uh, that I'm talking about. So, and, and that's what the court, you know, focused at. It's like not so much the due process on, on ordinary businesses that never made it to the, the, the Supreme Court, but the but the religion closings did make it to the Supreme Court. And so, what did they end up concluding? That they concluded the, the, basically the rule is that that the government has to treat religious religion as as kind of as well as it treats any other similarly situated activity. So, 
uh, if you closed, um, so if you keep supermarkets open, you got to keep the churches open to the same extent. That's kind of what the majority of the court said. And the dissenter said that, that supermarkets and stores like that are not the proper analogy, uh, to churches and that you should look to what the government's doing about singing and theaters and sporting events. Uh, so and- I want, I wonder if a sports event could have said, okay, this is actually a religious service. And in the middle of the religious service, we're going to play the Super Bowl. <laughs> I wonder if that, <laughs> I wonder if that would have solved the problem for sporting events. Well, religion does help you with the Supreme Court. That's for sure. So maybe. That's interesting. There's, there's all these loopholes. So, you know, one issue which has occurred ever since the Civil War is the issue of secession. Does the Constitution spell out when a state can secede? And I'm thinking again of this Texas stuff. And there's a movie coming out next month called The Civil War. Uh-huh. And what's so this is going to be a question that people are going to have. What makes it is, is it possible for a state to secede legally? Now, Abraham yeah. Lincoln would say no. And right. Prob- correctly for him at that time, he, he did a, a, the right thing. But just what's the Constitution say about it? I don't think the Constitution, the text of the Constitution addresses that, uh, the succession question. I, 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 honestly, it's another area where I'm, uh, I, it's, it's, I, I, there, I bet there's a lot of writing and a lot of thinking about it. And I don't, it's just doesn't, it's not something I happen to know about. So, but I don't think there's anything in the Constitution. There's no process for, for secession, like that you would, you would expect. Right. If, if it, if it was contemplated by the framers, right. A state can decide to secede if it has a vote of this or that. But, you know, there's going to be, there are going to be theories like, um, um, the, the, that the, that the federal government is a creation of the various states and if a state, you know, wants to re- withdraw its consent that it can do so. But the con, the response would be, will be that the, the constitution is derived from the power of the people, not the states. Um, and uh, that states have no authority to to leave the union. I, th- I think I bet that's uh, the prevailing view. Is that, but uh, but I th- that there that secession is kind of contrary to the principles of the Constitution. But I I'm sure there are also well thought out arguments on the other side. Uh, I yeah, uh, right as you said, we have the Civil War precedent. But but have we seen anything since? You, what, you think we we will? It, that'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, I well, what would have ha- yeah, sorry. What would have happened if, you know, the the army and the Texas National Guard came to blows, so to speak, and Texas said, "You know what? We're out. Count us out. We're done. We're done with this shit." Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I don't think. <laughs> right. I mean, Texas famously has had six flags. Right. <laughs> so you know they've been part of a bunch of different governments, and that they've left. Uh. They might leave this one. They might have a seventh flag. We're gonna have to change all the amusement park names. No, that might. Um, I, you know, it's one of those things. Like, um, like I was saying, you know, it's at some point earlier in the conversation. Like, uh, it, for many, many years, there you don't have the, uh, you know, the it's it, it's not caught a certain kind of action or 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 presidential, you know, behavior or whatever it is is not contemplated. So nobody thinks about whether, what the constitution might say about it. And then, you know, someone, uh, you know, makes a, uh, a, a decision that's outside of the norm. And then everybody's like, oh my God, what is, what does this thing say about it? Um, and, and it's, it's got all these little, you know, pieces in there, uh, which lay dormant for, for, for could for, could be for hundreds of years. And then something raises the issue and we have to look at what the text is and, and, and what it says and what it meant. And, you know, and then all of a sudden everybody's got an opinion about it. Right. So, so nobody thought about it for a hundred years. And then within a week, everybody got some view about it. Um, I, I, right. I, this it's, it's, uh, and then the con, at least me, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I try to slowly come up with my views. So, so it takes me a while to, you know, read and think through, what it is. And meanwhile, there's this raging debate going on about what whatever section of the Constitution means. And I feel like, oh, wait a second, hold on, this might be hard. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know the secession question. I know people are talking about it and thinking about it, but I don't know what the, uh, what the answer is. I, I know that there's no process in the constitution for it. So we yeah, have to go I don't think the constitution, I don't think the constitution mentions secession. It just mentions, you know, again, in the, probably in the context of the civil war, the 14th amendment, it refers to insurrectionists are bad, right? but it doesn't really define what insurrection is. And it, it doesn't equate. Isn't that interesting? Insurrection with secession. Like, like there's so many, uh, you know, uh, invasion, insurrection, you know, rebellion, war, religion. These things are all in the Constitution, but they're not, they're not defined. Uh, and uh, and usually you don't have to define them. But now we have to think: what is insurrection? What is invasion? Uh, um, it's interesting that they didn't define them. Like it's it's it, it seems to be on purpose because they understood that the country will change. And that's kind of a deep understanding to to think that when when making the constitution. Yeah, I mean, I think if that's the case, and I think I think it certainly was the case for for some of the framers at least, um, right? That is really sophisticated, right? We're going to leave this a lot of this document kind of open ended. Um, we use phrases like well, this is the Fourteenth Amendment now, but equal protection and um, and uh, you know the, the the Bill of Rights, uh, due process of law. And, uh, freedom of free exercise of religion, these sort of ambiguous phrases, uh, with the idea that they will be filled up and given content by the generations. But that also, you know, some there, there's, there's definitely a view among some of the justices and a lot of the people who study the constitution that, that that's not what the framers, you know, either not what they wanted or not how we should read their frame, their intent. And that what we should be doing is not sort of allowing people to update and the the meaning of the constitution to fit the 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 the, the changing circumstances of the day, but rather go back and find out, you know, what did invasion mean in you know 1787? Like, what was the original public meaning of that word? And then that becomes fit the the fixed meaning of the word. And that's one of the, you know the ma- one of the major, if not the major, interpretive debates about the constitution like how to read it do you do you read it according to what it meant if you could figure that out from you know to the people who wrote it or do you assume that the framers intended for it to the meaning to change over time and if that's the case how do we decide uh how to give those you know, ambiguous words content and who who gives it content is it the court is it some political process um, a lot of questions there. You know, and, and one issue that's come up a lot recently, and I, I shouldn't say recently, it's all the time basically, but it's it's struck home in various ways recently, is freedom of speech. Because you see on all these college campuses, you know, people uh, marching and saying, you know, free Palestine from the river to the sea, which the implication is, as spelled out in the Hamas charter, is kill all the Jews between the river and the sea. So now does freedom of speech allow for cause of death or like where, where does freedom of speech really end? Cause you're not allowed to call for instance, for uh death to the United States in freedom of speech. Like that's, I believe that's considered a crime. If you call for, if you actually incite people to commit crimes. Well, you- so yeah, I mean, there's a, there's um, you know, specific rules about that. Like incitement can be prohibited. So you can, but incitement has to, is a very, is a term of art that, that basically the court decided in a case from the sixties said, you know, that, that in order to be prosecuted for incitement, somebody has to, um, sort of expressly call for the violation of the law in a circumstance where it is, uh, likely to immediately occur. Right. So that's, that's why you have the, all this debate about, uh, for example, Trump's January 6th speech is that, was that an incitement or not an incitement? And people have different mm-hmm. views about that. Right. Because, because it has to, it has to have this immediacy, uh, for, for, for it to, to be pros to be prosecutable. Um, if it, 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 and the idea is to distinguish between kind of abstract, um, you know, declarations of ideology and an actual call to immediate law breaking. And between those two, there's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, unclear room. So, so 
but the but at least so far the court has been very you know it's been very protective of free speech rights uh, in that through that incitement content now there are other other things that can get that that aren't protected by the first amendment that could come into play like threats like a true threat is not protected um by the first amendment and like if i email someone and say you know i should just kill you I, yeah. is that prosecutable um maybe uh <laughs> like if it's like um so there it has to be the government would have to prove that you uh i, I think it's sort of a combination that you really did want to, you know, kill somebody and that it was understood by the, the listener as being, as, as posing like a real, a reasonable fear of, that you're going to do it. Like it's sort of a, com a combination of kind of an objective standard and a subjective standard, but like, um, but yeah, true threats against like the president, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, that's a crime, um, to, uh, and it gets prosecuted from time to time, but, but they're, those are rare. Yeah, and, and, you know, it's an interesting thing, the Constitution, because on the one hand, it seems like it's constantly violated and no one cares. Like, for instance, in the Constitution, it seems like the president actually has very few powers, right? So the, so the president, he has the ability to advise Congress on what laws should they, they should pass. He has the ability to kind of hang out with ambassadors and ministers of foreign countries. He has the ability to make treaties. He's the commander in chief, but it's unclear what that means. Right. So, like, what actual laws or what what actual power does the president constitutionally have as opposed to what he has now? Yeah. So the, that's uh, definitely the case that presidential power has increased over time, and congressional acquiescence in presidential power basically is, you know, been been part of the the reason for that. And Congress has just not stepped up and done its job. For example, Congress hasn't declared war since. World War II, um, right? So the president has the commander in chief power. The Congress has the declare war power. Those are supposed to be complementary, but Congress never declares war. And then the question is, you know, does the president have the power to unilaterally start hostility somewhere? And, and, and part of the, part of the issue here is that the courts, the Supreme Court in particular is, well, doesn't want to jump in on many of these disputes. Like, when you have the president and Congress in a battle over foreign affairs power, the court will sometimes step in, but usually they're like, this is a political question. This is not something that the court should get involved with. But so you're right that the president, you know, has these enumerated powers in the constitution and they're fairly limited. Like if you compare the size of the article one, which gives Congress the power to the size of article two, which gives the president power, it's article one is way longer and has a lot more stuff in there. On the other hand, though, the uh, this is an interesting difference in how the the text is uh, uh, reads between Article One and Article Two, which is in Article One it says the legislative powers here and granted are vested in the Congress, which indicates that it's all just the powers that are listed in the Constitution that the Congress gets. Whereas the the executive power in Article Two it says the executive power is vested in a president, um, right? It doesn't say the executive powers here and granted. Rather says the executive power. And so the, the idea, and this has been debated for 200 years is the executive power meant something in 1787, um, beyond just what's listed in the constitution. And, and by, by not having the words here and granted in the article two, the indication is that all that executive power, whatever it was, was given to the president. So it doesn't have to be necessarily everything spelled out in article two for the president to have the power. That's a, the presidents have always said, um, and there, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a strong argument based on the difference between those two. So, so, so the courts have kind of read a lot of inferred or implied powers into, into what the president can do, like the power to exclusively, um, do diplomacy, for example, is one of those pro powers, the power to remove executive officials. That's not in the constitution, but the courts have said the president does have that power in most cases. So, um, so, so I agree that the presidents uh, have taken more power over time. I think part of the, the, the fault is with Congress for not sort of pushing back, but there is a textual hook in the constitution for whatever that's worth that would signal that the president has more powers than just what's listed in the, in the doc. Okay. That, that explains a lot then about like, what's the deal with executive orders? Like 
Well, when a president makes an executive order, is that law? Yeah, yeah. So I think people have a misconception about what executive orders are. They're, they're not just the president saying stuff. Um, they have to be they have to be grounded in a, either a specific statute. And a lot of executive orders are just implementations of statute. Um, uh, and one example is there's this, this statute that gives the president the power to create national monuments called the Antiquities Act. So when the president makes national monuments, the president issues, it's actually not an executive order, it's a proclamation, but the difference is just form, not substance. And the president's just implementing the president's power under the statute. So it either has to be grounded in a specific statute or some presidential power granted by the Constitution, either one of those that are specifically enumerated or one that's inferred from the grant of the executive power to the president. And so when a president, you know, issues an executive order, tells like the executive branch to do, you know, consider small business uh, 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 considerations whenever making a rule, the president's just using their kind of their power to run the executive branch to tell the agencies under the president's control, you got to do this. And I'm the head of the executive branch. I'm telling you, you should do this. Now, there are some, there, once in a while, there'll be a, a controversial executive order, um, you know, where it's like a war, like, like, like sending troops to a war. Yeah. And keep, it's sending troops to war, keeping them there, absent a de declaration of war. Uh, those are probably done through executive order, but, um, but, but some sort of presidential action, right? And, and, and there's nothing like special about an executive order other than it's called an executive order. It has a number. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so, so that, that the president, but even in that situation, um, even in that situation where it's not entirely clear if the president has some power in the constitution that they're acting under there, in that case, they will usually, the president will usually ask the justice department, the, the legal department in the justice department called office of legal counsel, which is a place I worked many years ago, um, which makes uh, actually issues memoranda and decisions of law, uh, that you, most of which are, well, many of which are publicly available on the, on the website that you can look at and read. Um, not all are, but, um, uh, in which the, which the justice department, you know, tries to explain why the president has this power. Of course, you know, they're biased, right? They work for the president. So they tend to be pro presidential power documents, but they're not, they're not a hundred percent, um, uh, uh, you know, pro president, there is some division, at least there's a norm that there's a division between this justice department who opines on what powers the president has and the president whose lawyer, most you know, close lawyers, the white house counsel, who's viewed as the personal kind of more, much more closely, not related, but a, a, a much closer counselor to the president than the, the justice bar. I, I, uh, is this making sense? And, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so what I'm wondering is like, let's take Afghanistan as a situation. Uh -huh. Like how did the, how did the justice department justify? And again, I'm not making a political opinion, mm -hmm. whether it's right or wrong. I'm just curious. How did they justify not having Congress uh, requ not requiring Congress to issue a declaration of war against Afghanistan. We fought a whole war there for like 20 years. Yeah. Um, right. And, and, and there are many other examples also. Right. And I mean, I think the, I, um, and there may be specific rationales that apply to uh, Afghanistan, but not Kosovo or whatever. But, uh, but I mean, generally the idea is that if, that the president has this sort of inherent power to protect the the country through military through their through the president's commander in chief power and that um and 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 and, and the declare war power is is viewed by the executive branch as being a, a, a kind of a minor uh like some like a like a a, um, a legal action that has some domestic law implications like certain things maybe don't kick in if congress hasn't declared war or not but the president has always, you know, taken the view, even up against the war powers resolution. So Congress has tried to limit the president's authority to stay in conflicts over time. And presidents have always viewed that as an infringement on the president's commander in chief power. So it's always based on a very broad understanding of the commander in chief power as a power to protect the country and promote federal, uh, promote national interests through military uh, actions. Uh, right. This is an area where Congress could, could, 
you know, fight back because Congress does, in addition to have the power to declare war, also has the powers of the purse, right? The, co- the money is appropriated by Congress. And so if Congress really wants, you know, to pick a fight with the president that, and really, you know, take action, they could cut off the money for the, the, the military effort. Of course that, and I think Congress has threatened that on occasion and, and, and it's not politically, uh, you know, uh, you know, it has political problems because you have troops already in the field. And so what, what does that, the cutting off of money mean for that, you know, for, for them? But, but, but con- my point is only that the president has taken a very strong interpretation of the commander in chief power. Congress could take action to kind of push back on that, but it, 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 it really hasn't. Um, the war powers resolution notwithstanding, um, it, it really has kind of let the president, president do what the president wants. Well, you know, all these issues, of course, revolve around my main worry, which is civil war happening in the next few years. Yeah. I mean, I remember in 1989, I was 21 years old and Tiananmen Square happened in China. And I asked a friend of mine, I I, I was 21. I asked this friend of mine who was from China. I'm like, does does this make you happy? Because, oh, this is a a statement of freedom that maybe China is going to be free, whatever. I didn't know what that meant then. And I still don't know. but. And he, he said something very interesting. He said, no, he doesn't like it because he has old parents in China and he basically likes the status quo because old people have a harder time with change. And as I get older now, I understand what he means. <laughs> Me like, too. Me too. For, for good or for bad, I really don't want a civil war, as exciting as it might sound. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, so I get concerned about all of these constitutional questions that seem like it's really getting to this life or death point with, with all these issues going to the Supreme Court. So I, I appreciate you coming on to the show. You know, Jay Wexler, professor at Boston University, author, among other books, of The Odd Clauses, Understanding the Constitution Through Ten of Its Most Curious Provisions, and many other books that hopefully we'll talk about on, on future podcasts, including, I want to read your book about Satanists. That sounds really interesting. Um, what's the oddest clause for you in the Constitution? I love the third amendment, uh, the quartering of troops. And, uh, it's just, it's, um, like it's, it's, it's a clause that's never come up. It came up once in one case once, uh, which is actually how I start my constitutional law class with that one case. It's not even a Supreme court case. Um, it's just, it's, it's something that was so important to the framers. Right. I mean, it wouldn't be there if it weren't, it wasn't, there's nothing. Yeah, number three. It's number three. It's pretty high amendment. up, right? <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Um, right after freedom of speech and the right to bear arms, right. it's like, you cannot have soldiers force their way into your house and, and live there. Right. And, and, uh, like it's worked really well. Uh, right. So some people think it's just silly. Um, uh, but the, the other view is that it's, uh, like so clear and that, that, that it's just, that's, it's doing its work. It's doing, you know, best, the best work of any clause in the constitution, because it's, it's never, you know, really, it's never happened. Well, it has happened. I mean, I think it did happen during the civil war, but, um, here and there, but, but, um, so that's my, that's kind of my favorite. I think. You know, do you know the stand up comedian, Eric Andre? I don't think so. Do, uh, do... he probably, you, if you saw his face, you would recognize yeah. him. He had a show, the Eric Andre show, and he's been in some movies, some TV shows, but anyway, I've seen his act in person and, uh, his first bit is what the hell is the third amendment oh, yeah. about? <laughs> and he goes all into the third amendment. So I, I don't know if that ever made it onto a Netflix special. It probably did. But if I, if I find that clip, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's, it's, it's all about the third amendment. He says it's the weirdest thing in the constitution. It's excellent. So he agrees with you. Oh, good, good, good. The onion did a great piece on the third amendment, a classic piece about like the anti quartering, the national anti quartering organization <laughs> celebrates its 230th successful year or something. It's really great. That's funny. Well, uh, Professor Wexler, thank you so much for coming on and answering my questions. I hope all of these situations get resolved peacefully. If not, please come on again and talk about them. And I I really appreciate you coming on. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate that. Thank you.